It's time to see what the LDS Church says about their polygamy history. Welcome to Candlewick Library, I'm Cheryl. Now that you've heard the stories of how polygamy was practiced and you've heard the stories of these women that it affected, I want to read and show you the response of what the LDS Church wants people to know about polygamy. I need to stress here, it is very important that what I'm about to read is all they want you to know. The average LDS person that is faithful and is doing what they are told to do by their leaders is not going to go into the deep dives that I went into to learn about those women. The average person is going to talk about polygamy in almost hushed voices. They're gonna talk about polygamy in a faithful way. They're going to talk about their ancestors. I have mentioned on here before, I am a product of polygamy. I have many ancestors that were polygamous. It was just a fact of life that I knew about even not having been completely raised, knowing everything about the church, and I will get into that later more in my story, but I still knew that it existed. And when I moved to Utah, polygamy was familiar to me because I would see polygamists at the store. And I've told you before, I've talked to polygamists, I've worked with polygamists, I knew I had it in my past. And I did always somehow know that Joseph Smith was a polygamist, but I didn't know the extent. I always knew Brigham Young was, and some of the men after him and during that time period. But we never really talk about it. Nobody ever talks about Joseph Smith's polygamy. What I'm going to read today is, is, is the Gospel Topics essay on polygamy from the, church, from the LDS Church's website. The Gospel Topics essays were introduced starting in 2013, and these were basically a response to the fact that people were starting to talk openly online about church history. And as people found out about things like the Book of Abraham and like the translation of the Book of Mormon with the rock in the hat and all of these other things that had not been talked about at all before that, the church really was kind of forced to put out something for their members to be able to go to and read if they hear this. So you go to your bishop and you say, I have heard something about polygamy that worried me. And they'll say, okay, go to the church website because you really aren't supposed to go to any source that isn't from the church. Go to the church's website and go to the Gospel Topics essay and let me tell you they are not super easy to find. You have to know exactly what you're looking for and search for it in the search bar. Maybe that's different now, but when I was looking for them to begin with, I had a harder time finding them. Sometimes I would go back to find them and have a harder time than I did the time before that. So let's just say they're not on the main page. So you have to know that they're there to go looking for them and you have to search. So the Gospel Topics essays cover a wide variety of subjects, and this is the one on polygamy. The first thing that I want to mention is that when they write these essays, there usually is one main essay, and that is the case with this polygamy essay. There is a main essay, and it's very short. This is my printout of the main essay. It is one page front and back, and this page the front, and a little teeny bit of the back with footnotes. So less than three and a half pages. Throughout this small essay, there are places that say, if you want to learn more, click here. If you click there, you will get this much. You will get more essays that go deeper into polygamy. The average person, it has been shown in studies, will not click on the extra things because they just want to go and read what the church is saying about polygamy, because then they, if they don't find what they heard, then they can say that it wasn't true. I'm going to read the main essay first because the average member that goes and reads the Gospel Topics essay that is not on a deep dive and doesn't think the church is hiding anything from them will only read this. So I'm gonna read this first and then I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna show you what you will see if you go deeper. But you will still see how much they leave out based on what I have been telling you in the, over the last few videos. Plural marriage in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Latter-day Saints believe that the marriage of one man and one woman is the Lord's standing law of marriage. In biblical times, the Lord commanded some to practice plural marriage. And occasionally I'm going to stop and I'm going to comment on the things in this essay. So hopefully that doesn't bother you. But there, that is something that immediately bothered me because I don't believe God ever has sanctioned plural marriage. And people will say they will cite the Bible for that but from all the study I've done on the Bible in the past couple of years, I have learned that he actually never did. And the only reason I believed he did before this time was because our LDS scriptures twisted the stories in the Bible to make, it, make us think that he had. He allowed them to be sinful and they had consequences. All right, so the Lord commanded some to practice plural marriage, the marriage of one man and more than one woman. By revelation, the Lord commanded Joseph Smith to institute the practice of plural marriage among church members in the early 1840s. For more than half a century, plural marriage was practiced by some 
Latter-day Saints under the direction of the church president. Latter-day Saints do not understand all God's purposes in instituting, the, through his prophets, the practice of plural marriage. The Book of Mormon identifies one reason for God to command it, to increase the number of children born in the gospel covenant in order to raise up seed unto the Lord. And of course, that is something that you need to stop and say, okay, well then why do we argue so much about Joseph Smith sleeping with his wife if the reason to have polygamy is supposed to be to have children? Plural marriage did result in the birth of large numbers of children within faithful Latter-day Saint homes. It also shaped 19th century Mormon society in many ways. Marriage became available to virtually all who desired it. Per capita inequality of wealth was diminished as economically disadvantaged women married into more financially stable households. And ethnic intermarriages were increased. I'm not quite sure what they mean by that, when they say, which they say which helped to unite, unite a diverse immigrant population. I'm guessing that they just mean people from different European places. I'm, I'm guessing that's what they mean by that. Plural marriage also helped create and strengthen a sense of cohesion and group identification among the Latter-day Saints. Church members came to see themselves as a peculiar people, covenant-bound to carry out the commands of God despite outside opposition. The beginnings of plural marriage in the church. Polygamy had been permitted for millennia in many cultures and religions, but with a few exceptions, it was rejected in Western cultures. This is again one of those things where they're trying to make it palatable to you reading it by making it sound like it is not such a wild and outlandish idea. In Joseph Smith's time, monogamy was the only legal form of marriage in the United States. But again, we are reminded, hey, it was illegal. The revelation on plural marriage recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 132 emerged partly from Joseph Smith's study of the Old Testament in 1831. Latter-day Saints understood that they were living in the latter days and what the revelations called the dis dispensation of the fullness of times. Ancient principles such as prophets, priesthood, and temples would be restored to the earth. Plural marriage practiced by ancient patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses was one of those ancient principles. The same revelation that taught of plural marriage was embedded with a, within a revelation about eternal marriage, the teaching that marriage could last beyond death. Now they're saying that there to make that also more palatable. Plural marriage, but also eternal marriage. And they're leaving out, and they will not cover this in the, in the full essay, so that's why I'm adding it now, that at that point, that was the only eternal marriage, was plural marriage. Now, people wouldn't want to think that because they believe that if they are married for eternity in the temple, that that means that they are them and their husband alone and there will not be polygamy. However, that's not true. It's not even true nowadays. The prophet of the church right now and his first counselor both are polygamists in heaven if the church was true because they both have two wives that they've been sealed to. Monogamous and plural marriages performed by priesthood power could seal loved ones to each other for eternity on condition of righteousness. The revelation on marriage stated general principles. It did not explain how to implement plural marriage in all of its particulars. In Nauvoo, Joseph Smith married additional wives and authorized other Latter-day Saints to practice plural marriage. The practice was introduced carefully and incrementally and participants vowed to keep their participation confidential, anticipating a time when husbands and wives could acknowledge one another publicly. If you would like to learn more about the beginnings of plural marriage in the church, click here. So I'll get to that in a minute. Plural marriage and families in 19th century Utah. Between 1852 and 1890, Latter-day Saints openly practiced plural marriage. Most plural families lived in Utah. Women and men who lived within plural marriage attested to talent challenges and difficulties, but also to the love and joy they found within their families. They believed it was a commandment of God at that time and that obedience would bring great blessings to them and their posterity. Church leaders taught that participants in plural marriages should seek to develop a generous spirit of unselfishness and the pure love of Christ for everyone involved. Although some leaders had large polygamous families, two-thirds of polygamous men had only two wives at a time. Church leaders recognized that plural marriages could be difficult, particularly difficult for women. Divorce was therefore available to women who were unhappy in their marriages. Remarriage was also readily available. Women sometimes married at young ages in the first decade of Utah settlement, which was typical of women living in the frontier areas at the time. At its peak in 1857, perhaps one half of all Utah Latter-day Saints experienced plural marriage as a husband, wife, or child. The percentage of those involved in plural marriage steadily declined over the next three decades. During the years that plural marriage was publicly taught, not all Latter-day Saints were expected to live the principle, though all were expected to accept it as revelation from God. Indeed, this system of marriage could not have been universal due to the ratio of men to women. Women were free to choose their spouses. There is some speculation about that. Whether to enter into a polygamous or monogamous union or whether to marry at all. Some men entered plural marriage because they were asked to do so by church leaders, while others initiated the process themselves. All were required to obtain the approval of church leaders before entering a plural marriage. 
If you would like to learn more about plural marriage and families in Utah, click here. Again, somebody that is faithful is not going to care about clicking and getting this much more information because they're not gonna think that there's gonna be anything that they need more than that. Anti-polygamy legislation and the end of plural marriage. Beginning in 1862, the U.S. government passed laws against the practice of plural marriage. After the U.S. Supreme Court found the anti-polygamy laws to be constitutional in 1879, federal officials began prosecuting polygamous husbands and wives during the 1880s. Believing these laws to be unjust, Latter-day Saints engaged in civil disobedience by continuing to practice plural marriage and by attempting to avoid arrest, by moving to the homes of friends or family, or by hiding under assumed names. When convicted, they paid fines and submitted to jail time. One of the anti-polygamy laws permitted the U.S. government to seize church property. Federal officers soon threatened to take Latter-day Saint temples. The work of salvation for both the living and the dead was now in jeopardy. In September 1890, Church President Wilford Woodruff felt inspired to issue the manifesto. Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them to do likewise. As you can see, just like with almost every doctrine that has changed in the church or thing that has changed, it has been because of government pressure. I was taught polygamy ended because God said, okay, we don't need it anymore. Then I found out, no, the government was threatening to take the church's property and money. And it's when property and money are involved that the church makes decisions. Sorry if I'm being a little snarky, but it, but this stuff really bothers me. And I, I think that people need to be thinking critically about this and why it came about and why they got rid of it. But as you'll see from this part, they didn't quite get rid of it yet. The full implications of the document were not apparent at first. The Lord's way is to speak line upon line, here a little, there a little, and you will get sick of that statement by the end of this. Like the beginning of plural marriage in the church, the end of the practice was gradual and incremental, a process filled with difficulties and uncertainties. The manifesto declared President Woodruff's intention to submit to the laws of the United States and new plural marriages within that jurisdiction largely came to an end. But a small number of plural marriages continued to be performed in Mexico and Canada under the sanction of some church leaders. As a rule, these marriages were not promoted by church leaders and were difficult to get approved, and that is an outright lie. They sent people to Canada and Mexico to continue polygamy. And now we have these, you have the LeBarons. Um, you've probably seen documentaries about that. There are still polygamous communities in Canada and in Mexico that have done a lot of harm and have had a lot of scary things come out of them, and that is when they were started. And they were sent there by the leaders of the church. Either one or both of the spouses who entered into these unions typically had to agree to remain in Canada or Mexico. On an exceptional basis, a smaller number of plural marriages were performed within the United States between the years 1890 and 1904. The church's role in these marriages became a subject of intense public debate after Reed Smoot, an apostle, was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1903. At the April 1904 General Conference, church president Joseph F. Smith issued a forceful statement known as the Second Manifesto making new plural marriages punishable by ex excommunication. Since President Smith's day, church presidents have repeatedly emphasized that the church and its members are no longer authorized to enter into plural marriage and have underscored the sincerity of their words by urging local leaders to bring non-compliant members before church disciplinary councils. If you would like to learn more about the end of plural marriage in the church, click here, and then you get this. Plural marriage was among the most challenging aspects of the restoration. For many who practiced it, plural marriage was a trial of faith. It violated both cultural and legal norms, leading to persecution and revilement. Despite these hardships, plural marriage benefited the church in innumerable ways. Through the lineage of these 19th century saints have come many Latter-day Saints who have been faithful to their gospel covenants as righteous mothers and fathers, loyal disciples of Jesus Christ, devoted church members, leaders and missionaries, and good citizens and prominent public officials. Modern Latter-day Saints honor and respect these faithful pioneers who gave so much for their faith, families, and community. So that is the main essay. So pretty tame, pretty much information everybody's going to have heard already. Some of them might not have known that it didn't end after the first manifesto and that they had to issue a second manifesto to really end it and then threaten excommunication for something that they had been taught they needed for exaltation. I might add. That's probably one of the only things that a lot of people might not know. So let's go back and see what is there if you click. Plural marriage in Kirtland and Nauvoo. So this was the first click, the early church. And some of this will be repetitive of what was in the main essay. So just if you hear something that you think you've already heard, you probably have. Latter-day Saints believe that monogamy, the marriage of one man and one woman, is the Lord's standing law of marriage. 
In biblical times, the Lord commanded some of his people to practice plural marriage, the marriage of one man and more than, more than one woman. Some early members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints also received and obeyed this commandment given through God's prophets. After receiving a revelation commanding him to practice plural marriage, Joseph Smith married multiple wives and introduced the practice to close associates. This principle was among the most challenging aspects of the Restoration, for Joseph personally and for other church members. Plural marriage tested faith and provoked controversy and opposition. Few Latter-day Saints initially welcomed the restoration of biblical practice entirely foreign to their sensibilities, but many later testified of power powerful spiritual experiences that helped them overcome their hesitation and gave them courage to accept this practice. Although the Lord commanded the adoption and later the cessation of plural marriage in the latter days, he did not give exact instructions on how to obey the commandment. I will say that based on scripture that Joseph Smith has, there are instructions and I'll get to that at the end of this. Significant social and cultural changes often include misunderstandings and difficulties. Church leaders and members experienced these challenges as they heeded the command to practice plural marriage and again later as they worked to discontinue it after Church President Wilfred Woodruff issued an inspired statement known as the Manifesto in 1890, which led to the end of plural marriage in the church. And again, remember, that's only publicly. Through it all, church leaders and members sought to follow God's will. Many details about the early practice of plural marriage are unknown. Plural marriage was introduced among the early saints incrementally and participants were asked to keep their actions confidential. They did not discuss their experiences publicly or in writing until after the Latter-day Saints had moved to Utah and church leaders had publicly acknowledged the practice. The historical record of early plural marriage is therefore thin. Few records of the time provide details and later reminiscences are not always reliable. Some ambiguity will always accompany our knowledge about this issue. Like the participants, we see through a glass darkly and are asked to walk by faith. The beginnings of plural marriage in the church. The revelation on plural marriage was not written down until 1843, but in its early verses, verses suggest that part of it emerged from Joseph Smith's study of the Old Testament in 1831. And of course, that also is something they want to have happen so that Fanny was not an affair, but was a wife. People who knew Joseph well later stated that he received the revelation about that time. The revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 132 states that Joseph prayed to know why God justified Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and Solomon in having many wives. The Lord responded that he had commanded them to enter into the practice. Latter-day Saints understood that they were living in the latter days in what the revelations called the dispensation of the fullness of times. Ancient principles such as prophets, priesthood, and temples, which would be restored to the earth. Plural marriage was one of those ancient principles. Polygamy had been permitted for millennia in many cultures and religions, but with few exceptions was rejected in Western cultures. In Joseph Smith's time, monogamy was the only legal form of marriage in the United States. Joseph knew the practice of plural marriage would stir up public ire, after receiving the commandment, he taught a few associates about it, but he did not spread this teaching widely in the 1830s. When God commands a difficult task, he sometimes sends additional messengers to encourage his people to obey. Consistent with this pattern, Joseph told associates that an angel appeared to him in three times between 1834 and 1842 and commanded him to proceed with plural marriage when he hesitated to move forward. In the episode where I talked about the Smith connection to folk magic, you'll remember that that three is a very important number. And even this angel is appearing three times. During the third and final appearance, the angel came with a drawn sword, threatening Joseph with destruction unless he went forward and obeyed the commandment fully. Fragmentary evidence suggests that Joseph Smith acted on the angel's first command by marrying a plural wife, Fanny Alger, in Kirtland, Ohio, in the mid-1830s. Several Latter-day Saints who had lived in Kirtland reported decades later that Joseph Smith had married Alger, who lived and worked in the Smith household, after he had obtained her consent and that of her parents. The footnote that they put there go, takes you to Levi Hancock's journal. And the funny thing about that is that if you quote things from Levi Hancock's journals, you will sometimes be told that it's not a good source, but then they use it in here. So it that goes to a bigger problem where if there is something in the Journal of Discourses that is faithful to the church, that looks good, they will use it. But if I use the Journal of Discourses to tell a quote from Brigham Young that's horrible, then somebody will try to discount me using the Journal of Discourses. They do that a lot. Little is known about this marriage and nothing is known about the conversations between Joseph and Emma regarding Alger. After the marriage with Alger ended in separation, Joseph seems to have set the subject of plural marriage aside until after the church moved to Nauvoo, Illinois. Plural marriage and eternal marriage. The same revelation that taught of plural marriage was part of a larger revelation given to Joseph Smith that marriage could last beyond death and that eternal marriage was essential to inheriting the fullness that God desires for his children. As early as 1840, Joseph Smith privately taught Apostle Parley P. Pratt that the heavenly order allowed Pratt and his wife to be together for time and all eternity. Joseph also taught that men like Pratt, who had remarried following the death of his first wife, could be married 
or sealed to their wives for eternity under the proper conditions. The sealing of husband and wife for eternity was made possible by the restoration of priesthood keys and ordinances. On April 3, 1836, the Old Testament prophet Elijah appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple and restored the priesthood keys necessary to perform ordinances for the living and the dead, including sealing families together. Marriages performed by priesthood authority could link loved ones to each other for eternity on condition of righteousness. Marriages performed without this authority would end at death. Marriage per performed by priesthood authority meant that the procreation of children and perpetuation of families would continue into the eternities. Joseph Smith's revelation on marriage declared that the continuation of the seeds forever and ever helped to fulfill God's purposes for his children. This promise was given to all couples who were married by priesthood authority and were faithful to their covenants. Plural Marriage in Nauvoo For much of Western history, family, interest, economic, political, and social considerations dominated the choice of spouse. Parents had the power to arrange marriages or forestall unions of which they disapproved. By the late 1700s, romance and personal choice began to rival these traditional motives and practices. By Joseph Smith's time, many couples insisted on marrying for love, as he and Emma did when they eloped against her parents' wishes. Latter-day Saints' motives for plural marriage were often more religious than economic or romantic. Besides the desire to be obedient, a strong incentive was the hope of living in God's presence with family members. In the revelation on marriage, the Lord promised participants crowns of eternal lives and exaltation in the eternal worlds. Men and women, parents and children, ancestors and progeny were to be sealed to each other, their commitment lasting into the eternities, consistent with Jesus' promise that priesthood ordinances performed on earth could be bound in heaven. The first plural marriage in Nauvoo took place when Louisa Beeman and Joseph Smith were sealed in 1841. Joseph married many additional wives and authorized other Latter-day Saints to practice plural marriage. It's important to note here that when this says he was sealed to Louisa Beeman, he wasn't even sealed to Emma yet, and I will go into that at the end of this. The practice spread slowly at first. By June 1844, when Joseph died, approximately 29 men and 50 women had entered into plural marriage, in addition to Joseph and his wives. When the saints entered the Salt Lake Valley in 1847, at least 196 men and 521 women had entered into plural marriages. Participants in these early plural marriages pledged to keep their involvement confidential, though they anticipated a time when the practice would be publicly acknowledged. Nevertheless, rumors spread. A few men unscrupulously used these rumors to seduce women to join them in an unauthorized practice sometimes referred to as spiritual wifery. They don't mention here that his brother William Smith was among these men. When this was discovered, the men were cut off from the church. It also doesn't mention that William was not. The rumors prompted members and leaders to issue carefully worded denials that denounced spiritual wifery and polygamy, but were silent about what Joseph Smith and others saw as divinely mandated celestial plural marriage. The statements emphasized that the church practiced no marital law other than monogamy, while implicitly leaving open the possibility that individuals under direction of God's living prophet might do so. Joseph Smith and plural marriage. During the era in which plural marriage was practiced, Latter-day Saints distinguished between sealings for time and eternity and sealings for eternity only. Sealings for time and eternity included commitments and relationships during this life, generally including the possibility of sexual relations. Eternity only sealings indicated relationships in the next life alone. They're putting the little seed of doubt there that not all of these would be intimate relationships, but they do go on to say, evidence indicates that Joseph Smith participated in both types of sealings. The exact number of women to whom he was sealed in his lifetime is unknown because the evidence is fragmentary. Some of the women who were sealed to Joseph later testified that their marriages were for time and eternity, while others indicated it was for eternity alone. Most of these sealed to Joseph Smith were between 20 and 40 years of age at the time of their sealing to him. The oldest, Fanny Young, was 56 years old. The youngest was Helen Mar Kimball, daughter of Joseph's close friend Heber C. and Violet Murray Kimball, who was sealed to Joseph several months before her 15th birthday. This is one of the things I went looking for when I started to hear stuff about polygamy. Was he really married to a 14-year-old? Because I couldn't believe that that was true. It honestly made me even more mad when I saw that they put several months before her 15th birthday. They don't want to put 14. It's like when you go to the store, there's something that costs $4.99 instead of $5 because you feel like you're spending less. They're using that same manipulation here to make it not sound as bad because you see 15th birthday and you think she's 15 years old. I don't know why that would be a good alternative, but it sounds better than 14, I guess. Marriage at such an age, inappropriate by today's standard, was legal in that era and some women married in their mid-teens. They use the word some, which is appropriate, but again, it makes you think that that's normal. Helen Mar Kimball spoke of her sealing to Joseph as being for eternity alone, suggesting that the relationship did not involve sexual relations. After Joseph's death, Helen remarried and became an articulate defender of him and plural marriage, and you know that that is not telling the whole story. 
Following his marriage to Louisa Beeman and before he married other single women, Joseph Smith was sealed to a number of women who were already married. Neither of these women nor Joseph explained much about these sealings, though several women said they were for eternity alone. They leave out here that most of those women were married to men that they could have been sealed to for eternity. They didn't need Joseph for that. Other women left no records, making it unknown whether their sealings were for time and eternity or for eternity alone. There are several possible explanations for this practice. These sealings may have provided a way to create an eternal bond or a link between Joseph's family and other families within the church, which they then could have used adoption for instead. These ties extended both vertically from parent to child and horizontally from one family to another. Today, such eternal bonds are achieved through the temple marriages of individuals who are also sealed to their own birth families, in this way linking families together. Joseph Smith's sealings to women already married may have been an early version of linking one family to another. I also would like to point out here that if these marriages were sealed only to link the families together, there would have been no need for sisters or a mother and daughter. He would have only needed one. In Nauvoo, most, if not all, of the first husbands seemed to have continued living in the same household with their wives during Joseph's lifetime, and complaints about these sealings with Joseph Smith are virtually absent from the documentary record. These sealings may also be explained by Joseph's reluctance to enter plural marriage because of the sorrow it would bring to his wife, Emma. Whoever wrote this is ridiculous. He may have believed that sealings to married women would comply with the Lord's command without requiring him to have normal marriage relationships. This could explain why, according to Lorenzo Snow, the angel reprimanded Joseph for having demurred on plural marriage even after he had entered into the practice. That is quite the spin. After this rebuke, according to this interpretation, Joseph returned primarily to sealings with single women. Another possibility is that in an era when lifespans were shorter than they are today, faithful women felt an urgency to be sealed by priesthood authority. Several of these women were married either to non-Mormons or former Mormons, and more than one of the women later expressed unhappiness in their present marriages. Again, I need to point out that only three of the married women were married to men that they couldn't have been sealed to. Living in a time when divorce was difficult to obtain, these women may have believed a sealing to Joseph Smith would give them blessings they might not otherwise receive in the next life. The women who united with Joseph Smith in plural marriage risked reputation and self-respect in being associated with a principle so foreign to their culture and so easily misunderstood by others. I made a greater sacrifice than to give my life, said Zina Huntington Jacobs, for I never anticipated again to be looked upon as an honorable woman. Nevertheless, she wrote, I searched the scripture, and by humble prayer to my heavenly father, I obtained a testimony for myself. After Joseph's death, most of the women sealed to him moved to Utah with the saints, remained faithful church members, and defended both plural marriage and Joseph. Joseph and Emma. Plural marriage was difficult for all involved. For Joseph Smith's wife, Emma, it was an excruciating ordeal. Records of Emma's reactions to plural marriage are sparse. She left no first-hand accounts, making it impossible to reconstruct her thoughts. Joseph and Emma loved and respected each other deeply. After he had entered into plural marriage, he poured out his feelings in his journal for his beloved Emma, whom he described as undaunted, firm, unwavering, unchangeable, affectionate Emma. After Joseph's death, Emma kept a lock of his hair in a locket she wore around her neck. Emma approved, at least for a time, of four of Joseph Smith's plural marriages in Nauvoo, and she accepted all four of those wives into her household doesn't say how they were already there and she kicked them out later. She may have approved of other marriages as well, but Emma likely did not know about all of Joseph's ceilings. She vacillated in her view of plural marriage, at some points supporting it and at other times denouncing it. I would say she never supported it. I think she would, the better way to say that was accepted for a moment. And I don't even know if accepted is the right word. In the summer of 1843, Joseph Smith dictated the Revelation on Marriage, a lengthy and complex text containing both glorious promises and stern warnings, some directed at Emma. The revelation instructed women and men that they must obey God's law and commands in order to receive the fullness of his glory. The revelation on marriage required that a wife give her consent before her husband could enter into plural marriage. Nevertheless, toward the end of the revelation, the Lord said that if the first wife received not this law, the command to practice plural marriage, the husband would be exempt from the law of Sarah, presumably the requirement that the husband gain the consent of the first wife before marrying additional women. After Emma opposed plural marriage, Joseph was placed in an agonizing dilemma, forced to choose between the will of God and the will of his beloved Emma. He may have thought Emma's rejection of plural marriage exempted him from the law of Sarah. His, her decision to receive not this law permitted him to marry additional wives without her consent. Because of Joseph's early death and Emma's decision to remain in Nauvoo and not discuss plural marriage after the church moved west, many aspects of their story remain known only to the two of them. Trial and Spiritual Witness Years later in Utah, participants in Nauvoo plural marriage discussed their motives for entering into the practice. God declared in the Book of Mormon that monogamy was the standard. At times, however, he commanded plural marriage so as people could raise up seed unto him. Plural marriage did result in an increased number of children born to believing parents. 
Some saints also saw plural marriage as a redemptive process of sacrifice and spiritual refinement. According to Helen Mark Kimball, Joseph Smith stated that the practice of this principle would be the hardest trial the saints would ever have to test their faith. Though it was one of the severest trials of her life, she testified that it had also been one of the greatest blessings. Her father, Heber C. Kimball, agreed, I never felt more sorrowful, he said of the moment he learned of plural marriage in 1841. I wept days. I had a good wife. I was satisfied. That's really sad when you think about how many wives he ended up with. The decision to accept such a wrenching trial usually came only after earnest prayer and intense soul searching. Brigham Young said that upon learning of plural marriage, it was, quote, it was the first time in my life that I had desired the grave. I had to pray unceasingly, he said, and I had to exercise faith and the Lord revealed to me the truth of it and that satisfied me. Heber C. Kimball found comfort only after his wife Violet had a visionary experience attesting to the rightness of plural marriage. She told me, Violet's daughter later recalled, she never saw so happy a man as father was when she described the vision and told him she was satisfied and knew it was from God. Lucy Walker, and you will remember her story, so try to bring that up, recalled her inner turmoil when Joseph Smith invited her to become his wife. Every feeling of my soul revolted against it, she wrote, yet after several restless nights on her knees in prayer, she found relief as her room filled with a holy influence akin to brilliant sunshine. She said, my soul was filled with a calm, sweet peace that I never knew and supreme happiness took possession of my whole being. And you'll notice that she, that they don't involve the fact that that was after many sleepless nights and fasting and a yeah, threat from him. Not all had such experiences. Some Latter-day Saints rejected the principle of plural marriage and left the church, while others declined to enter the practice but remained faithful. Nevertheless, for many women and men, initial revulsion and anguish was followed by struggle, resolution, and ultimately light and peace. Sacred experiences enabled the saints to move forward in faith. Conclusion The challenge of introducing a principle as controversial as plural marriage is almost impossible to overstate. A spiritual witness of its truthfulness allowed Joseph Smith and other Latter-day Saints to accept this principle. Difficult as it was, the introduction of plural marriage in Nauvoo did indeed raise up seed unto God. A substantial number of today's members descend through faithful Latter-day Saints who practice plural marriage. Church members no longer practice plural marriage. Consistent with Joseph Smith's teachings, the church permits a man whose wife has died to be sealed to another woman when he remarries. Women cannot be sealed to more than one man, though. Moreover, members are permitted to perform ordinances on behalf of deceased men and women who married more than once on earth, sealing them to all of the spouses to whom they were legally married. The precise nature of these relationships in the next life is not known, and many family relationships will be sorted out in the life to come. Latter-day Saints are encouraged to trust in our wise Heavenly Father who loves His children and does all things for their growth and salvation. So now if you're back in that first essay and you clicked on learning more about plural marriage in Utah, then you would go to this one. Plural marriage and families in early Utah. The Bible and the Book of Mormon teach that the marriage of one man to one woman is God's standard, except at specific periods when He has declared otherwise. In accordance with the revelation to Joseph Smith, the practice of plural marriage, the marriage of one man to two or more women, was instituted among members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the early 1840s. Thereafter, for more than half a century, plural marriage was practiced by some Latter-day Saints. Only the church president held the keys authorizing the performance of new plural marriages. In 1890, the Lord inspired church president Wilfred Woodruff to issue a statement that led to the end of the practice of plural marriage in the church. In this statement, known as the Manifesto, President Woodruff declared his intention to abide by U.S. law forbidding plural marriage and to use his influence to convince members of the church to do likewise. After the Manifesto, monogamy was advocated in the church both over the pulpit and through the press. On an exceptional basis, some new plural marriages were performed between 1890 and 1904, especially in Mexico and Canada outside the jurisdiction of U.S. law. A small number of plural marriages were performed within the United States during those years. In 1904, the church st strictly prohibited new plural marriages. Today, any person who practices plural marriage cannot become a, or remain a member of the church. You'll see the difference between the first manifesto was in 1890 and it wasn't until 1904 that it strictly prohibited new plural marriages, it says. This essay primarily addresses plural marriage as practiced by the Latter-day Saints between 1847 and 1890, following their exodus to the U.S. West and before the Manifesto. Latter-day Saints do not understand all of God's purpose for instituting, through his prophets, the practice of plural marriage during the 19th century. The Book of Mormon identifies one reason for God to command it, to increase the number of children born in the Gospel Covenant in order to raise up seed unto the Lord, Plural marriage did result in the birth of large numbers of children within faithful Latter-day Saint homes. It also shaped 19th century Mormon society in other ways. Marriage became available to vir virtually all who desired it. Per capita, inequality of wealth was diminished as economically disadvantaged women married into more financially stable households. And ethnic intermarriages were increased, which helped to unite a diverse immigrant population. 
Plural marriage also helped create and strengthen a sense of cohesion and group identification among Latter-day Saints. Church members came to see themselves as a peculiar people, covenant-bound to carry out the commands of God despite outside opposition, willing to endure ostracism for their principles. For these early Latter-day Saints, plural marriage was a religious principle that required personal sacrifice. Accounts left by men and women who practiced plural marriage attest to the challenges and difficulties they experienced, such as financial difficulty, interpersonal strife, and some wives longing for the sustained companionship of their husbands. But accounts also record the love and joy many found within their families. They believed it was a commandment of God at that time, and that obedience would bring great blessings to them and their posterity both on earth and in the life to come. While there was much love, tenderness, and affection within many plural marriages, the practice was generally based more on religious belief than on romantic love. Church leaders taught that participants in plural marriages should seek to develop a generous spirit of unselfishness and the pure love of Christ for everyone involved. During the years that plural marriage was publicly taught, all Latter-day Saints were expected to accept the principle as a revelation from God. Not all, however, were expected to live it. Indeed, this system of marriage could not have been universal due to the ratio of men to women. Church leaders viewed plural marriage as a command to the church, generally while recognizing that individuals who did not enter the practice could still stand approved of God. Women were free to choose their spouses, whether to enter into polygamous and monogamous union, or whether to marry at all. Some men entered plural marriage because they were asked to do so by church leaders, while others initiated the process themselves. All were required to obtain the approval of church leaders before entering a plural marriage. The passage of time shaped the experience of life within plural marriage. Virtually all of those practicing it in the earliest years had to overcome their own prejudice against plural marriage and adjust to life in polygamous families. The task of pioneering a semi-arid land during the middle decades of the 19th century added to the challenges of families who were learning to practice the principle of plural marriage. Where the family lived, whether in Salt Lake City with its multiple social and cultural opportunities or the rural hinterlands, where such opportunities were fewer in number, made a difference in how plural marriage was experienced. It is therefore difficult to accurately generalize about the experience of all plural marriages. Still, some patterns are discernible, and they correct some myths. Although some leaders had large polygamous families, two-thirds of polygamous men only had two wives at a time. Church leaders recognized that plural marriages could be particularly difficult for women. Divorce was therefore available to women who were unhappy in their marriages. Remarriage was also readily available. Women did marry at fairly young ages in the first decade of Utah settlement, age 16 or 17 or infrequently younger, which was typical of women living in the frontier areas at that time. As in other places, women married at older ages as the society matured. Almost all women married and did so, so did a large percentage of men. In fact, it appears that a larger percentage of men in Utah married than elsewhere in the United States at the time. Probably half of those living in Utah Territory in 1857 experienced life in a polygamous family as a husband, wife, or child at some time during their lives. By 1870, 25 to 30% of the population lived in polygamous households, and it appears that the percentage continued to decrease over the next 20 years. The experience of plural marriage toward the end of the 19th century was substantially different from that of earlier decades. Beginning in 1862, the U.S. government passed laws against the practice of plural marriage. Outside opponents mounted a campaign against the practice, stating that they hoped to protect Mormon women and American civilization. For their part, many Latter-day Saint women publicly defended the practice of plural marriage, arguing in statements that they were willing participants. After the U.S. Supreme Court found, it, found the anti-polygamy laws to be constitutional in 1879, federal officials began prosecuting polygamous husbands and wives during the 1880s. Believing these laws to be unjust, Latter-day Saints engaged in civil disobedience by continuing the practice plural marriage and by attempting to avoid arrest. When convicted, they paid fines and submitted to jail time. To help their husbands avoid pr prosecution, plural wives often separated into different households or went into hiding under assumed names, particularly when pregnant or after giving birth. By 1890, when President Woodruff's manifesto lifted the command to practice plural marriage, Mormon society had developed a strong, loyal core of members, mostly made up of immigrants from Europe and the eastern United States but the de demographic makeup of the worldwide church membership had begun to change. Beginning in the 1890s, converts outside the United States were asked to build up the church in their homelands rather than move to Utah. In subsequent decades, Latter-day Saints migrated away from the Great Basin to pursue new opportunities. Plural marriage had never been encouraged outside of concentrated populations of Latter-day Saints. Especially in these newly formed congregations outside of Utah, monogamous families became central to religious worship and learning. As the church grew and spread beyond the American West, the monogamous nuclear family was well suited to an increasingly mobile and dispersed membership. 
For many who practiced it, plural marriage was a significant sacrifice. Despite the hardships some experienced, the faithfulness of those who practiced plural marriage continues to benefit the church in innumerable ways. Through the lineage of these 19th century saints have come many Latter-day Saints who have been faithful to their gospel covenants as righteous mothers and fathers, loyal disciples of Jesus Christ, and devoted church members, leaders, and missionaries. Although members of the contemporary church are forbidden to practice plural marriage, modern Latter-day Saints honor and respect these pioneers who gave so much for their faith, families, and community. You can see as I read these that it's word for word parts of that first main essay. And so you can tell that they wrote these three essays first and then probably just like copied and pasted parts onto the smaller one of whatever they felt was the best thing for people to see. Otherwise, they would have just had the three essays there, but they chose to have a main one that you had to click through to find the other ones because they don't want most people reading all this information, like I said. And the last one is the manifesto and the end of plural marriage. I know it's not as exciting to just listen to me reading this word for word, but I think it is important. So bear with me. And if you don't wanna continue listening to all of this, uh, skip to the end and I'll be giving my thoughts at that point. For much of the 19th century, a significant number of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints practiced plural marriage. The marriage of one man to more than one woman. The beginning and end of practice were directed by revelation through God's prophets. The initial command to practice plural marriage came through Joseph Smith, the founding prophet and president of the church. In 1890, President Wilford Woodruff issued the manifesto which led to the end of plural marriage in the church. The end of plural marriage required great faith and sometimes complicated, painful, and intensely personal decisions on the part of individual members of the church leaders. Of course it did. They try to make it sound like not everybody did it, which they didn't. I do have some ancestor, one ancestor that didn't. He's always been one of my favorites because I respected him so much that he didn't do it. But imagine if you're told by your church leaders that to get exaltation, you have to be willing to do this. And then all of a sudden they're like, never mind, don't do it anymore. And you've already got all this family. I, I don't know what they expected to have happen. Like the beginning of plural marriage in the church, the end of the practice was a process rather than a single event. Revelation came, and again, quote, uh, line upon line, precept on pr upon precept. This is something that is so overused in the church. Everything is line upon line, precept on precept, because then they can tell us, oh, you have this much information now and just wait. When we change something later because we need to or we want to, then we can't argue against it because we're getting line upon line, precept upon precept. Anti-polygamy laws and civil disobedience. For half a century, beginning in the early 1840s, church members viewed plural marriage as a commandment from God. Of course they did. They were told that it was. An imperative that helped raise up righteous posterity unto the Lord. Though not all church members were expected to enter into plural marriage, those who did so believed they would be blessed for their participation. Between the 1850s and the 1880s, many Latter-day Saints lived in plural families as husbands, wives, or children. In many parts of the world, polygamy was socially acceptable and legally permissible, but in the United States, most people thought that the practice was morally wrong. These objections led to legislative efforts to end polygamy. Beginning in 1862, the U.S. government passed a series of laws designed to force Latter-day Saints to relinquish plural marriage. In the face of these measures, Latter-day Saints maintained that plural marriage was a religious principle protected under the U.S. Constitution. The church mounted a vigorous legal defense all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In Reynolds v. United States in 1879, the Supreme Court ruled against the Latter-day Saints. Religious belief was protected by law. Religious practice was not. According to the court's opinions, marriage was a civil contract regulated by the state. Monogamy was the only form of marriage sanctioned by the state. Polygamy, the court explained, has always been odious among the northern and western nations of Europe. Latter-day Saints sincerely desired to be loyal citizens of the United States, which they considered a divinely founded nation. But they also accepted plural marriage as a commandment from God and believed the court was unjustly depriving them of their right to follow God's commands. Confronted with these contradictory allegiances, church leaders encouraged members to obey God rather than man. Many Latter-day Saints embarked on a course of civil disobedience during the 1880s by continuing to live in plural marriage and to enter into new plural marriages. The federal government responded by enacting ever more punishing legislation. Between 1850 and 1896, Utah was a territory of the U.S. government, which meant that federal officials in Washington, D.C. exercised great control over local matters. In 1882, the U.S. Congress passed the Edmonds Act, which made unlawful cohabitation, interpreted as a man living with more than one wife, punishable by six months of imprisonment and a $300 fine. In 1887, Congress passed the Edmonds Tucker Act to punish the church itself, not just its members. The act dissolved the corporation of the church and directed the all church property over $50,000 be forfeited to the government. Stop there. In the first one, it said that they could get property and the temples and that that was the problem because they need those temples. But here it's saying dissolved the entire corporation of the church 
and all the property over $50,000 to be forfeited. This is why it was changed. This government opposition strengthened the saints' resolve to resist what they deemed to be unjust laws. Polygamous men went into hiding, sometimes for years at a time, moving from house to house and staying with friends and relatives. Others assumed aliases and moved out of the way places in southern Utah, Arizona, Canada, and Mexico. Many escaped prosecution. Many others, when arrested, pled guilty and submitted to fines and imprisonment. This anti-polygamy campaign created great disruption in Mormon communities. The departure of husbands left wives and children to tend farms and businesses, causing incomes to drop and economic recession to set in. The campaign also strained families. New plural wives had to live apart from their husbands, their confidential marriages known only to a few. So kind of like it, how it started. Pregnant women often chose to go into hiding at times in remote, remote locales rather than risk being subpoenaed to testify in court against their husband. Children lived in fear that their families would be broken up or that they would be forced to testify against their parents. Some children went into hiding and lived under assumed names. Despite countless difficulties, the, many Latter-day Saints were convinced that the anti-polygamy campaign was useful in accomplishing God's purposes. They testified that God was humbling and purifying his covenant people as he had done in ages past. Myron Tanner, a bishop in Provo, Utah, felt that the hand of oppression laid on the parents is doing more to convince our children of the truth of Mormonism than anything else could have done. Incarceration for conscience sake proved edifying for many. George Q. Cannon, a counselor in the First Presidency, emerged from his five months in the Utah penitentiary, rejuvenated. My cell has seemed a heavenly place and I feel the angels have been there, he wrote. The church completed and dedicated two temples during the anti-polygamy campaign, a remarkable achievement. But as federal pressure intensified, many essential aspects of church government were severely curtailed and civil disobedience looked increasingly untenable as a long-term solution. Between 1885 and 1889, most apostles and stake presidents were in hiding or in prison. After federal agents began seizing church property in accordance with the Edmunds Tucker legislation, management of the church became more difficult. The Manifesto. After two decades of seeking either to negotiate a change in the law or avoid its disastrous consequences, church leaders began to investigate alternative responses. In 1885 and 86, they established settlements in Mexico and Canada outside the jurisdiction of U.S. law where polygamous families could live peaceably. Hoping that a moderation in their position would lead to a reduction in hostilities, church leaders advised plural husbands to live openly with only one of their wives and advocated that plural marriage not be taught publicly. In 1889, church authorities prohibited the performance of new plural marriages in Utah. Church leaders prayerfully sought guidance from the Lord and struggled to understand what they should do. Both President John Taylor and President Wilford Woodruff felt the Lord directing them to stay the course and not renounce plural marriage. This inspiration came when paths for legal redress were still open. The last of the paths closed in May 1890 when the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Edmunds Tucker Act, allowing the conf confiscation of church property to proceed. President Woodruff saw that the church's temples and its ordinances were now at risk. Burdened by this threat, he prayed intensely over the matter. The Lord showed me by vision and revelation, he later said, exactly what would take place if we did not stop this practice. All the temples would go out of our hands. God has told me exactly what to do and what the result would be if we did not do it. On September 25, 1890, President Woodruff wrote in his journal that he was under the necessity of acting for the temporal salvation of the church. He stated, After praying to the Lord and feeling inspired by his spirit, I have issued a proclamation. This proclamation, now published in the Doctrine and Covenants as Official Declaration 1, was released to the public on September 25th and became known as the Manifesto. The Manifesto was carefully worded, as they still word everything, to address the immediate conflict with the U.S. government. We are not teaching polygamy or plural marriage, nor permitting any person to enter into its practice, President Woodruff said. Inasmuch as laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them do likewise. The members of the Quorum of the Twelve varied in their reactions to the manifesto. Franklin D. Richards was sure it was the work of the Lord. Francis M. Lyman said that he endorsed the manifesto fully when he first heard it. Not all the Twelve accepted the document immediately. John W. Taylor said he did not yet feel quite right about it at first. John Henry Smith candidly admitted that the manifesto had disturbed his feelings very much and that he was still somewhat at sea regarding it. Within a week, however, all members of the Twelve voted to sustain the manifesto. The manifesto was formally presented to the church at the semi-annual general conference held in the Salt Lake Tabernacle in October 1890. On Monday, October 6, Orson F. Whitney, a Salt Lake City bishop, stood at the pulpit and read the Articles of Faith, which included the line that Latter-day Saints believed in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. These articles were sustained by uplifted hand. Whitney then read the manifesto and Lorenzo Snow, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, moved that the document be accepted as authoritative and binding. The assembly was then asked to vote on this motion. 
The Deseret News reported that the vote was unanimous. Most voted in favor, though some abstained from voting. Rank and file Latter-day Saints accepted the manifesto with various degrees of reservation. Many were not ready for plural marriage to come to an end. General Relief Society President Zina D.H. Young, writing in her journal on the day the manifesto was presented to the church, captured the anguish of the moment. Today the hearts of all were tried but looked to God and submitted. The manifesto prompted uncertainty about the future of some relationships. Eugenia Washburn Larson, fearing the worst, reported feeling dense darkness when she imagined herself and other wives and children being turned adrift by husbands. Other plural wives, however, reacted to the manifesto with great relief. After the manifesto, Latter-day Saints believe that the Lord reveals his will, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Church members living in 1890 generally believed that the manifesto was the work of the Lord, in Franklin D. Richards' words. But the full implication of the manifesto was not apparent at first. Its scope had to be worked out, and authorities differed on how best to proceed. We have been led to our present position by degrees, Apostle Heber J. Grant explained. Over time and through effort to receive continuing revelation, church members saw, by degrees, how to interpret the manifesto going forward. At first, many church leaders believed the manifesto merely suspended plural marriage for an indefinite time. Having lived, taught, and suffered for plural marriage for so long, it was difficult to imagine a world without it. George Q. Cannon, a counselor in the First Presidency, likened the manifesto to the Lord's reprieve from the command to build temples in Missouri, in the 1830s, after the saints were expelled from the state. In a sermon given immediately after the manifesto was sustained at General Conference, Cannon quoted a passage of scripture in which the Lord excuses those who diligently seek to carry out a commandment from him only to be prevented by their enemies. Behold, it behooveth me to require that work no more at the hands of those sons of men, but to accept their offerings. Nevertheless, many practical matters had to be settled. The manifesto was silent on what existing plural families should do. On their own initiative, some couples separated or divorced as a result of the manifesto. Other husbands stopped cohabitating with all but one of their wives, but continued to provide financial and emotional support to all dependents. In closed-door meetings with local leaders, the First Presidency condemned men who left their wives by using the manifesto as an excuse. I did not, could not, and would not promise that you would desert your wives and children, President Woodruff told the men. This you cannot do in honor. Believing that the covenants they made with God and their spouses had to be honored above all else, many husbands, including church leaders, continued to cohabit with their plural wives and fathered children with them well into the 20th century. Continued cohabitation exposed those couples to a threat of prosecution, just as it did before the manifesto. But these threats were markedly diminished after 1890. The manifesto marked a new relationship with the federal government and the nation. Persecution of polygamists declined. Plural wives came out of hiding and assumed their married names, and husbands interacted more freely with their families, especially after U.S. President Benjamin Harrison granted general amnesty to Mormon polygamists in 1893. Three years later, Utah became a state with a constitution that banned polygamy. The manifesto declared President Woodruff's intention to submit to the laws of the United States. It said nothing about the laws of other nations. Ever since the opening of colonies in Mexico and Canada, church leaders had performed plural marriages in these countries. And after October 1890, plural marriage continued to be quietly performed there. It is important to note that it's, it was illegal in both of those countries as well. As a rule, these marriages were not promoted by church leaders and were difficult to get approved. Either one or both of the spouses who entered into these unions typically had to agree to remain in Canada, Canada or Mexico. Under exceptional circumstances, a smaller number of new plural marriages were performed in the United States between 1890 and 1904. Though whether the marriages were authorized to have been performed within the states is unclear. The precise number of new plural marriages performed during these years, inside and outside the United States, is unknown. Sealing records kept during this period typically did not indicate whether a sealing was monogamous or plural, making an exhaustive calculation difficult. A rough sense of scale, however, can be seen in the chronological ledger of marriages and sealings kept by church scribes. Between the late 1880s and early 1900s, during a time when temples were few and travel to them was long and arduous, Latter-day Saint couples who lived far away from temples were permitted to be sealed in marriages outside of them. The ledger of marriages and sealings performed outside the temple, which is not comprehensive, lists 315 marriages performed between October 17, 1890 and September 8, 1903. Of the 315 marriages recorded in the ledger, research indicates that 25 were plural marriages and 290 were monogamous. Almost all of the monogamous marriages recorded were performed in Arizona or Mexico, of the 25 plural marriages, 18 took place in Mexico, three in Arizona, two in Utah, and one each in Colorado and on a boat on the Pacific Ocean. Overall, the record shows that plural marriage was a declining practice and that church leaders were acting in good conscience to abide by the terms of the manifesto as they understood them. The exact process by which these marriages were approved remains unclear. 
For a time, post-manifesto plural marriages required the approval of a member of the First Presidency. There is no definitive evidence, however, that the decisions were made by the First Presidency as a whole. President Woodruff, for example, typically referred requests to allow new plural marriages to President Cannon for his personal consideration. By the late 1890s, at least some of the men who had authority to perform sealings apparently considered themselves free to either accept or reject requests at their own discretion, independent of the First Presidency. Apostle Heber J. Grant, for example, reported that while visiting Mormon settlements in Mexico in 1900, he received 10 applications in a single day requesting plural marriages. He declined them all. I confess, he told a friend, that it has always gone against my grain to have any violation of documents, i.e. the manifesto of this kind. The Second Manifesto At first, the performance of new plural marriages after the manifesto was largely unknown to people outside the church. When discovered, these marriages troubled many Americans, especially after President George Q. Cannon stated in an 1899 interview with the New York Herald that new plural marriages might be performed in Canada and Mexico. After the election of B.H. Roberts, a member of the First Council of the Seventy, to the U.S. Congress, it became known that Roberts had three wives, one of whom he married after the manifesto. A petition of seven million signatures demanded that Roberts not be seated. Congress complied and Roberts was barred from the office. The exclusion of B.H. Roberts opened Mormon marital practices to renewed scrutiny. President Lorenzo Snow issued a statement clarifying that new plural marriages had ceased in the church and that the manifesto extended to all parts of the world, counsel he repeated in private. Even so, a small number of new plural marriages continued to be performed, probably without President Snow's knowledge or approval. After Joseph F. Smith became church president in 1901, a small number of new plural marriages were also performed during the early years of his administration. The church's role in these marriages became a subject of intense debate after Reed Smoot, an apostle who was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1903. Although Smoot was a monogamous, his apostleship put his loyalty to the country under scrutiny. How could Smoot both uphold the laws of the church, some of whom, uh, whose officers had performed, consented to, or participated in new plural marriages, and uphold the laws of the land which made plural marriage illegal? For four years, legislators debated this question in lengthy public hearings. The Senate called on many witnesses to testify. Church President Joseph F. Smith took the stand in the Senate chamber on March 1904. When asked, he defended his family relationships, telling the committee that he had cohabited with his wives and fathered children with them since 1890. He said that it would be dishonorable of him to break the sacred covenants he had made with his wives and with God. When questioned about new plural marriages performed since 1890, President Smith carefully distinguished between actions sanctioned by the church and ratified in church councils and conferences and the actions undertaken by individual members of the church. There never has been a plural marriage by the consent or sanction or knowledge or approval of the church since the manifesto he testified. So was he lying under oath? Because we know that's not true. In this legal setting, President Smith sought to to protect the church while stating the truth. His testimony conveyed a, distinct, conveyed a distinction church leaders had long understood. The manifesto removed the divine, divine command for the church collectively to sustain and defend plural marriage. It had not up to this time prohibited individuals from continuing to practice or perform plural marriage as a matter of religious conscience. So we're seeing that he had a loophole where he felt like he was telling the truth. The time was right for a change in this understanding. A majority of Mormon marriages had always been monogamous and a shift toward monogamy as the only approved form had long been underway. In 1889, a lifelong monogamous was called to the Quorum of the Twelve. After 1897, every new apostle called into the Twelve, with one exception, was a monogamous at the time of his appointment. Beginning in the 1890s, as church leaders urged members to remain in their native lands and build Zion, in those places, rather than immigrate to Utah as in previous years, it became important for them to abide the laws mandating monogamy. During his Senate testimony, President Smith promised publicly to clarify the church's position about plural marriage. At the April 1904 General Conference, President Smith issued a forceful statement known as the Second Manifesto, attaching penalties to entering into plural marriage. If any officer or member of the church shall assume to solemnize or enter into any such marriage, he will be deemed in transgression against the church and will be liable to be dealt with according to the rules and regulations thereof and excommunicated therefrom. This statement had been approved by the leading councils of the church and was unanimously sustained at the conference as authoritative and binding on the church. The Second Manifesto was a watershed event. For the first time, church members were put on notice that new plural marriages stood unapproved by God and the church. Second Manifesto expanded the reach and scope of the first. When the manifesto was given, Elder Francis M. Lyman, president of the Quorum of the Twelve, explained, it simply gave notice to the saints that they need not enter plural marriage any longer, but the action taken at the conference held in Salt Lake City on the 6th day of April, 1904, made that manifesto prohibitory. Church leaders acted to communicate the seriousness of this declaration to leaders and members at all levels. President Lyman sent letters to each member of the Quorum of the Twelve by direction of the First Presidency, advising them that the Second Manifesto would be strictly enforced. Contrary to direction, two apostles, John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley, 
continued to perform and encourage new plural marriages after the second manifesto. They were eventually dropped from the quorum. Taylor was later excommunicated from the church after he insisted on his right to continue to perform plural marriages. Callie was restic restricted from using his priesthood and later admitted that he had been wholly in error. Some couples who entered into plural marriage between 1890 and 1904 separated after the Second Manifesto, but many others quietly cohabitated until the 1930s and beyond. Church members who rejected the Second Manifesto and continued to publicly advocate plural marriage or undertake new plural marriages were summoned to church disciplinary councils. Some who were excommunicated coalesced into independent movements and are sometimes called fundamentalists. These groups are not affiliated with or supported by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Since the administration of Joseph F. Smith, church presidents have repeatedly emphasized that the church and its members are no longer authorized to enter into plural marriage and have underscored the sincerity of their words by urging local leaders to bring non-compliant members before church disciplinary councils. Conclusion Marriage between one man and one woman is God's standard for marriage unless he declares otherwise, which he did through his prophet Joseph Smith. The manifesto marked the beginning of the return to monogamy, which is the standard of the church today. Speaking at General Conference soon after the manifesto was given, President George Q. Cannon reflected on the revelatory process that brought the manifesto about. The presidency of the church have to walk just as you walk, he said. They have to take steps just as you take steps. They have to depend on the revelations of God as they come to them. They cannot see the end from the beginning as the Lord does. All that we can do, Cannon said, speaking of the first presidency, is to seek the mind and will of God. And when that comes to us, though it may come in contact with every feeling that we have previously entertained, we have no option but to take the step that God points out and to trust to him. All right, so now I want to give some of my final thoughts on this. First of all, at the end of that last essay, they talk about the fundamentalists and as you saw, if you were if you listened to the whole thing, then you know that it talked about people that left and went to Arizona and Southern Utah and Colorado and Mexico and Canada. And then later on at the end of the essay, it talks about fundamentalists that still do polygamy, how they are not affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Well, those fundamentalists started from those groups that were. These were people that were sent away to do their plural marriage, and then all of a sudden they were told that they couldn't do it anymore and that they would be excommunicated and they believed that the church leaders were in apostasy and they weren't going to give up the thing that they believed God had commanded them to do and that is where the fundamentalists come from. So they're not affiliated with the church leaders today but they are affiliated with the beginning of the church and they have the same belief system as far as the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and all the different doctrines that were taught in Joseph Smith's day and in fact if you know about Warren Jeffs and his FLDS his church actually has more in common with the early LDS church than the modern LDS church does. Some of the common themes that we've seen through these last videos is that a lot of times the girls that he picked lived with him. They were using older wives to recruit younger wives. There was the angel with the drawn sword. And Mike from LDS Discussions brought up a really good point. He said there were only a few times that God thought something was important enough to send an angel according to LDS history. Those times were Moroni with the golden plates, the restoration of the priesthood, Elijah's transfer of the sealing keys, and Joseph's failure to marry multiple women. He said if this was so important that an angel with a drawn sword would come, why not visit the girls? Why would the angels not visit the girls? And also, why would God tell Joseph Smith through the Book of Mormon that polygamy wasn't okay, but then send an angel of destruction when he questioned it? None of those things make any sense. Mike said on, his, on LDS discussions, if God sent an angel to me and said I needed to start having sex with more women or I would die, I would like to hope that I would tell the angel to go back to whatever hell it came from. I also want to address something I kept alluding to, which is that Joseph was sealed to other women before Emma Smith. And so a lot of people would just probably assume that she was the first one he was sealed to, and then any woman he was sealed to after, would be after that. But he actually was sealed to at least 22 other women and girls before Emma. She was the 23rd wife sealed to him. And he actually died without being sealed to his children or his parents. Also, through a lot of these stories, they've talked about spiritual witnesses. It talked about it in the essays a lot. In some of the videos, when I was talking about women, they would talk about their spiritual witness that they received. And I'm going to read something really quick. I've been searching for a witness of this work and of this church, and just tonight I got my witness. And it's burning within my soul how important this work is and how true it is. I know it is. And it is hard to believe that just a year ago I was in high school and now I am in a plural marriage and struggling. But I know without a shadow of a doubt that this is the Lord's work, that I have finally found it. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You might think that that was from the early days of polygamy in the LDS church because 
when you can see this video of this young lady crying as she says this, it sounds exactly like any testimony meeting that you would go to on the first Sunday of every month in any LDS church across the world. But this was a young girl in an LDS polygamous offshoot branch, one of those fundamental groups. And yet it sounds exactly the same. The problem with these spiritual witnesses is I can't tell somebody if they've had a spiritual experience or not. Spiritual experiences are talked about and they are manipulations because these people are told to go into something being told already what the outcome should be. You go and you watch that spiritual witness video, you will see spiritual witnesses given by people from all sorts of cults and religions all over the world. And everyone says the exact same thing. You cannot believe in something just because of that spiritual witness. You have to have truth to it as well. We cannot say that polygamy was okay. Would anyone watch that young girl in sacrament meeting in this fundamentalist group? Any Mormon nowadays, would they honestly be able to watch that and say, oh, okay, well, I believe God really did give her a spiritual witness that what she's doing is okay and where she's at is the truth. They wouldn't. And yet they will use that same argument for girls just like her in the LDS church. Also, I wanted to touch on in DNC 132, it does give some rules of polygamy, even though the essays make it sound like there weren't any rules. They said that the union had to be with a virgin. The first wife had to be given the opportunity to consent. And then if she didn't, then the husband could take any wife um, or she would be destroyed. But how often were these women virgins? And how often was Emma consulted first? The woman must be a virgin before marriage and monogamous after or she would be destroyed. And yet how many of these women were still married to their husbands? The point was to multiply and replenish the earth and bear the souls of men, uh, which is consistent with the Book of Mormon saying that you couldn't have it unless it was to raise up seed. And yet we use these arguments that Joseph Smith was not having that kind of relationship with these women. So he not only broke his own scriptural rules and Bible rules like the mother, daughter, sister, and sister, but he also get, had dishonesty in his public sermons, even to the destruction of a press. Like I said, when he, when he stated that what a thing for a man to be accused of committing adultery and having seven wives when I can only find one, I am the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago, and I can prove them all perjurers, which is in the history of the church, volume six, chapter 19, page 411. At this point, when he said that, he had already taken 30 plural wives by May of 1844 when he made this denial. They also believed that it always had been and that polygamy was God's way. Brigham Young said that when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body and brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. That's in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 1. Jedediah M. Grant, second cousin to Brigham Young, said that one of the reasons Jesus Christ was persecuted so much was because he, because he had so many wives. There was Elizabeth and Mary and a host of others that followed him. That's also in Journal of Discourses, Volume 1. Orson Hyde also taught this. Many of the early church leaders taught that Jesus Christ was a polygamist. They have also taught that God was a polygamist. So when so many Latter-day Saints talk with the sacred hush voices about their heavenly mother, which heavenly mother? Because if you're going by the doctrine of your own church, God has multiple wives as well. And they taught that it was essential to salvation. Why would God have changed that if he is an unchanging God? In the next videos, I will be outlining the very last chapters of the book. We'll finally be done with this series and I will be talking more about what led to the death of Joseph Smith. Stay tuned for that. There will probably only be one more video, maybe two at the most, but probably only one. So I'll see you next time.